So UBS uh, also got a fine of 787 million, not as much as the Credit Suisse. But again, we find out that we have 4,000 clients in the US avoiding tax, so these clients also are going to be hit with some high tax bills and penalties. So, the international, another NGO, the International Consortium, when you say consortium it means group of investigative journalists, do you understand investigative journalists? It's a dangerous job sometimes being an investigative journalist. It means that they go and find out the information and then print in the newspaper. Especially if you're finding that information about criminals, it can be dangerous. They released 2.5 million files <coughs> documenting the offshore bank accounts and shell companies of wealthy clients and tax dodging corporations. So a little bit like WikiLeaks. Uh, so this WikiLeaks-like action produced instant results in forcing states to become more proactive. So we can see that these days states, the UK, Germany, they're starting to chase people about tax. The NGOs are pushing the states to do that. Okay? Especially if they do some WikiLeaks action and show all these names of all these people. The government doesn't have much choice. They're going to have to uh, chase and find out the result. So Luxembourg, you said that the EU is pressurizing Switzerland nowadays. But Luxembourg has said its bank secrecy policy expires in 2015. <clears throat> so Prime Minister David Cameron, we talked about him before, the UK Prime Minister, was recently elected again for another four years. He tried to make a 10-point plan to combat the global tax evasion for the G8. So we have the G8 and the G20, where those countries get together a lot of time it's quite boring things they're talking about, like financial regulation. People think, you might think the G8 gets together and spend all their time talking about the environment, right? Actually, they don't. Most of their time is spent on finance and financial regulation. Okay? So, <clears throat> here he's talking about tax evasion. So, he proposed this plan, but in 2011, his government passed a law that excused UK-based corporations from paying tax on their over offshore earnings. So the UK corporations make earnings overseas, they don't have to pay tax in the UK. So David Cameron's government is quite right-wing government. So we can see that uh, they have a different attitude. But, however, no G8 country supports British, Britain's call for the registries of beneficial ownership of companies to be made public. So we can see this problem. When I was in the UN, the UN interns don't get paid any money. And I said that that's bad for students from developing countries because they can't afford to go to New York, pay for the rent, and pay for the food. So it should be that the interns should be paid the interns from China, because I noticed that all of the interns from China or Africa or Southern American countries, they were all from the elite families of those countries. They had a lot of money that they could send them to New York to do the internship in the UN. But actually what the world needs is for the people who's not from the elite family from those countries to come to the UN right, and get that kind of education. So I said, why doesn't the UN pay their interns? Then they could have people from the middle class or the lower class from those countries getting the better education. They said the reason is those countries, governments said not to pay the interns. So you can see the problem here, right? The government itself in that country decided that they don't want the interns to be paid. That means that only the wealthy, only the wealthy people from their country can go and do the internship in New York. Okay. It should be the other way around. So, uh, <clears throat> also, like I mentioned before, in Ecuador we had the 
I have a guy in British American Tobacco saying the government doesn't want to spend money on education. They don't want the people. They want to continue this kind of unequal situation. So, in this case again, we have governments who are not supporting Britain's call. Uh, Russia and Germany, he couldn't get them to publish national action plans for tax evasion. He failed to get the G8 leaders to agree that an agreement to an automatic exchange of tax information should be open immediately to developing countries. So, however, he did manage to get the Britain's overseas territories and crown dependencies, like the islands, to sign on to a set of core principles. Core principles, important <coughs> vocabulary about global agreements. Okay, we talked about principles before for the sharing of tax information. <clears throat> so the G8, the G8 often makes a very wide declaration because they can't agree on specific things. So this is an example. They just say, global officials should fight the scourge of tax evasion. Okay? They make some statements. They meet for three days, don't make any concrete or specific conclusion. Then they just say, well, we should fight tax evasion. We agreed we should fight tax evasion. Does that mean, is that an action plan? Yes. Right, that's just quite general statement. It's very different from action plan. Right? If you want to have effective meaning, you have to make action plans, some action you're going to do, not just a, a general statement, right? So, uh, in the US, we also have a state called Delaware, which has a tax shelter for corporations. 2012, Delaware is home to a million companies, public and private. If you want to have an address in Delaware, you just buy a little post box. You can find these offices, and all they have is little post box, little post boxes. That means that you have an address in that state. Okay, then you can use that to say, my company is registered in Delaware. And then you can find some way to pay the tax at a lower rate. Because the US, each state can make their own uh, policies. So, who are the beneficiaries and who are the losers in this offshore tax havens? So, according to Saxon, developing countries are the losers. The, Money is flowing from developing countries to countries like Switzerland, Delaware, in the US, right? The UK islands like Cayman or Bermuda Islands. So if you think of an easy example, do you like Kim Jong-un, North Korean dictator? Yes. Do you like him? He has a nice haircut. <laughs> Are you trying to style your haircut? Or? You need to shave under the side here. That will be okay. Next time, you can get that haircut. Do you know anybody in Korea who has the same haircut as Kim Jong-un? No. no? Don't you think it would be funny if you get this haircut? It'd be funny. You should do it the next time just to be funny. Where do you think he has his money? Where, what country do you think he has his money? Switzerland. Where did he go to university? Switzerland. So I guess he has his money in Switzerland, in a Swiss bank account. So this is the extreme example. You have a lot of North Korean people who are starving or don't have enough food. And you have all the money from North Korea sitting in the Switzerland bank account, right? Earning interest for Kim Jong-un. So we can find this also in extreme example in some African countries where you have a lot of diamonds or minerals, right? Where you have the president or his family are making a lot of money off the minerals. Where are they sending the money? Are they keeping it in Africa? They might be putting it in some secret bank account in the UK or in Switzerland or in the US, right? So that money that could be used in by the banks in Africa to give loans to the African companies, right? Instead of sitting in banks in other countries, that money is being used in other countries to give loans and so on. So this is $10 for every dollar of foreign aid going in. So, one dollar of foreign aid goes to the developing countries, ten dollars comes out in uh, hidden uh, financial outflow. 
so we can get an idea of the size. So many, for this reason, many Africans think that the globalization pro project is a form of colonialism in disguise. So if we look at the world's history, I think there's one word which sums up if you read about world history, it's resources. Do you understand resources? Yes, almost all of the wars have been about resources and colonialism was about resources. So in Africa, the European countries came to Africa. What can you tell us about history of colonialism in Africa? You, you, you lived in Africa. Give us a brief history of colonialism in, Has in Africa. Africa was colonized by UK. South Africa by the UK? Yes. No. The Boers? Also yeah. from the Netherlands. Oh, really? Hmm? I didn't know that. Do you know the Boer people in the Netherlands? Boer? No. B O E R. From the Dutch. The UK were also involved at some stage, right? Was it Netherlands? Yes, the Boer I people. Never knew about people that. from a part, a part, a part of the Netherlands <gasps> who came to South Africa. Oh. <laughs> so you have France in North Africa, North West Africa. You have a lot of French-speaking countries. Yes. You have Italian in Ethiopia. Right? You yes. have the UK and other countries. Portugal, Spain. What did they do to those countries? They took all the diamonds. Mm. Yes. Took everything, took all the people for slaves at the start, yes. took all the diamonds, took everything out of the country. Yes. Right? That's just the colonialism. So Africans have a... Do they have a good opinion of Europeans? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Yeah. Do you guys have a nice opinion of the Japanese? No. What did Japan take out of Korea? Intentional. We don't have any oil or diamonds. Okay. Is there Italian in Ethiopia? Yes, Mussolini also was there. Ethiopia. Is it official language? Uh, no, I don't think they speak Italian now. Just Italy colonized you know, oh. yeah, a couple of countries in North Africa. Yes. <coughs> so these days, Africans see this as a kind of colonialism that the money is flowing out of the country of the wealthy people. So perhaps we can find some way to stop banks from taking that kind of money out of those countries. So the African policy group, in the UN we have different groups. Usually we have the uh, group of the OECD group of developed countries, we have a group of emerging economies, big emerging economies like India, Brazil, China, often support each other. And then we have other groups from the transition economies in Africa, right? They make their own group, it means they vote together, they make some policy together. So, there's an African policy group. Actually, these days the G8 shouldn't be making policy. The G20 or the G20 plus other policy groups. G8 is just seven countries. It's two post-World War II, right? System. So, G20 is more important these days. But the G8 still meets. And the, just the policy, another group can make some suggestion to the G8. So, the African policy group made this suggestion, even if they're not in the G8. Right? They want a global system of tax information sharing. The identification of real owners of bank accounts, so you can't have secret bank accounts. Okay? Uh, public reports by multinational corporations about their tax payments in which they conduct business. So, uh, <coughs> this is quite a sensible and reasonable proposal. Right? So hopefully in the future, uh, also, we can take into account more the opinion of African countries, right? Even in the G20, uh, South Africa may be the only country in the G20 from Africa, right? So we need to listen more to those countries in the international area. So the G8 said that they don't, it's, they don't want to hand over sensitive tax details to countries which are not trustworthy enough to handle them and care. So even they won't give the money, the information to the government, even not, without making it public, they won't even give the information to the governments. They say it's too 
uh, sensitive. Do you understand sensitive? We use sensitive for information. It means that we don't, it's information that could cause problems. So discuss with your partner. Why do offshore tax havens represent a form of social injustice? Shifting the tax burden. Do you understand shifting? Somebody has to pay for the roads, somebody has to pay for the police, somebody has to pay for the teachers. So if these people are putting their money offshore, they're not paying any tax. So they're not, on that money, they're not paying their fair share of the tax. Okay? <clears throat> then, secondly, local banks have less money to make loans, right? Yes. <laughs> you can see that this is important. In the financial crisis, this was the main reason governments give for bailing out the banks. Right? If we don't bail out the bank, we'll have a zombie bank. Do you understand zombie bank? Yes. Zombie bank will be there, but it won't be making any loans, because it won't have any money. So where are the business going to get their loans from? Okay. So it's the same. If everybody is sending their money abroad, the local banks don't have any deposits to make loans into the local community. So we have these two types of problems. You can see it's bigger than the aid money going in. So time will tell whether public outrage, public outrage means people getting angry, <laughs> over offshore tax evasion will eventually force the hand of the Western politicians who have shown so little interest in consigning the offshore system to the dustbin of history. So what way do you think the people will vote in Switzerland? Do you think people in Switzerland would vote that people can have secret accounts or people cannot have secret accounts? They can have secret accounts. You think they'll vote that they can have secret accounts? Yeah, because it will bring in the benefit by now, so why should they vote? Okay. We can talk about this episode on later, but I think people would like to keep that. Okay. So hopefully, the point is that we hope that the public will, first of all, decide that that's not the right thing to do. 
So then vote for politicians. Yes. What do you think they will decide for? I think I'm optimistic. Okay. <laughs> yes, I think they will decide that uh, uh, no, that's wrong to have the secret accounts. We should do like the... But do you think this is realistic? I, I am an because idealist. Because they're main, like, you know, advantage. <laughs> yes. If you look at just what game theory, what's in their interest, then you're right, that's in their interest, right? But I think that people might say that, no, that's not the right thing to do, so they might not. Chris, are you going to finish all these rest mm -hmm. of the papers today? Today? No. No. <laughs> Do you want me to? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you telling me to hurry up? <laughs> Give me some hints. I need to hurry Sorry. up. Sorry. <laughs> too slowly. Okay. So uh, then let's talk about the global regulation. What do you think? Is it easy or hard to make global law? A law that applies to everybody in the whole world. Is that easy or hard? Hard. What kind of laws apply to everybody in the whole world? In Kotel. Hmm? In Kotel. There's some... Yes, there's a UN Convention on Commercial Law. The UN Convention on Commercial Law. So if people sign up to that, then... Not all... Only 81 countries have signed up to this. So 81 countries at least are doing that. Okay, what other law is global law? What law do we have in every country? That's the same. CRS. <laughs> what? CRS. <laughs> so every, every culture says murder is wrong, right? So we always every country has a law that you can't can murder or steal or that kind of thing, right? But they make more their own law. So we don't really need international law in that area. So we need to make international law over things like the environment, financial regulation, those kind of things, right? So regulation is a process that occurs over stages. It includes making an agenda, negotiating, implement. This is not the end, we negotiate. We have to implement, do you understand implement? Put into action, operate, monitor, make sure it's happening, and enforce. If, if somebody is not doing it, then they need to get some punishment. So it's not as simple as just making the regulation. We have to remember the word, right? No. Well, it's t useful, actually. If you remember these words, they're useful for business. Right? Agenda setting, negotiating, implementing. Often in English, you hear to implement a program. We need to implement this program. It means put into action. Put into action is a long way. Well, implement is a nice word. Put into action is a long way, so implement. Monitor, watching or checking, enforcing. For contracts, we talk about contract enforcement. <coughs> so, what kind of organizations can initiate? Initiate means, say, we need a global regulation. So can you tell me, what kind of organizations would say, we need a new regulation in the world about this? Like what, for example? Mm -hmm. What kind of regulation do you think the world needs? Greenpeace, I would say something about pollution and stuff. Environmental. Yeah, environmental suggestion. Like what? Like, let's use the car less. Right, we have CO2 emissions as a problem, so... We need to cut down to CO2, right? So we can see the United Nations, the WHO, the IWC. For example, we don't have many whales left. Is that a national issue or a global issue? Global. Do we need to make a global law about killing whales? Yes. Yes? <laughs> Anti-doping agency. Taking drugs in sports, in sports competitions, is that a global issue? Global. Yeah, so we're going to look at the challenges that these organizations have in, ma in making global regulation, to understand about how to make global regulation. So, one example that we need global regulation for is ships and airplanes, right? 
we need the same rules for airplanes all over the world. Okay, they all speak in English when they give the information to the tower. They all speak and reply in English. For example, you couldn't have an airplane from Africa coming into London and then they say, <laughs> 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 What? <laughs> then they don't know what they're saying, right? It could be from France or anywhere, right? And, and then the plane just crashed into the other plane, right? So we need to have some code or general regulation about that. So the regulation was in the end, we should speak in English for the planes, right? Same for the ships, right? They have to have some regulation for the ships. Food and agriculture, uh, labor organizations, telecommunications, and postal union. Post, right? Sending things by mail. So these things are all global areas where the UN has these organizations which are coordinating, making regulation. If there's a new regulation about telecommunication, then this organization will have a conference at the UN, right? They'll have a conference, they'll meet people from the different countries, different businesses can go write different representatives and they'll try to come up with a new regulation. Global regulation can also be undertaken or supported by NGOs such as Greenpeace, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch or Transparency International. I think we already mentioned here. So we have different value systems. We talked about before different countries have different values, different people. Different countries have different value systems. Different ethical judgments, different ways of saying this is ethical or that's not ethical, and different standards of what's decent conduct or not. So, international organizations such as the UN were created after World War II to represent ideal norms of this kind. Okay? Most, for one of the early documents of the UN, an important document, Inter International Declaration of Human Rights by uh, Roosevelt was the president and his wife Eleanor Roosevelt, she was responsible for making this document. It was an idealistic document, not rules, but it was saying that everybody has a right to this, everybody has a right to this, everybody has a right to this. So countries should follow that. So in some cases we can see the UN is quite idealistic. Do you understand idealistic? Who is your idealistic partner? If you could have any wife in the world. Who is your idealistic <laughs> wife? What about you guys? Who is your idealistic wife? Kim Yuna? <laughs> hmm? Who is your idealistic wife? It's not 
really going to happen. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just tell me your ideal ideal. Uh, in this class, John Jin? In the global um, business department. <laughs> <laughs> might be assumed to be the administration of a global <coughs> technology-based system such as shipping or aviation or telecommunications. So we have to use the same technology system for shipping, right, to see the ships coming into the port. So that's very practical. An idealistic regulator would be concerned about human rights or human health. Okay? So everybody in the world should get the vaccine. Do you understand vaccine? Yes. Well, that's an idealistic uh, one. So, <clears throat> global regulation is a necessary idea. We need to have this. It does not possess infallible unitary doctrine nor absolute mandate to impose itself on international disputes. This means basically it doesn't have an army. There's no army behind global regulation. Okay. We don't have a global army. The closest thing we can come to that is we have some war criminal like Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. Even then, the US is not supposed to go into the territory of another country without their permission. So Osama bin Laden was caught in Pakistan, but that was against international law. The US was not allowed to go into Pakistan without the permission of the Pakistanis. Right? Each country has its own sovereign uh, army and defense system. So the US broke international law by going into Pakistan in secret and catching Osama bin Laden. Okay? So we don't have an international army. Who's going to punish the US for breaking the international law? <laughs> Pakistan? Maybe they won't import Coca-Cola anymore. <laughs> hurt the US too much, right? So well, it may seem funny, but it's a real thing, right? We don't have a, a mandate to impose ourselves on international disputes. Did anything happen, by the way? Did anything no, just the Pakistani government said we're not happy. <laughs> and the US government said, well, we're sorry. Well, we had to get him, and uh, yes, they didn't even say uh, we were happy to call. Uh, they told him that we couldn't tell you beforehand because if we told you, then Osama bin Laden would have found out and escaped. Because yeah. actually, they found Osama bin Laden right next to the Palestinian military barracks. <coughs> so if they had told the Palestinian military, they might have warned him beforehand. So they said we had to tell, we go in secret. And at the end of the day, what they said was getting Osama bin Laden was more important than respecting the international law in this case. Do you agree with the US or Pakistan? US. With the US? In this case. In this case? You don't? 
It's a hard question. <laughs> I think the U.S. should respect international law. That's my answer to that question. Maybe. Next terroristic action would be on Ireland, then we'll change your mind. Maybe. So I don't think terrorists are Ireland either. <laughs> <laughs> Too small. It doesn't have any. It was the victim instead of the abuser before in the past. So people usually like Irish people. <laughs> so, uh, what kind of organizations sponsor globalized? Global regulation, regulations, and why do they do so? Discuss with your partner. Human law, human rights for most of the practical regulation for airlines and mm, ships and postal top. service. UN. The UN, right? The UN has some organizations. Every country has a representative at the UN. Do you want to be a diplomat? Do you want to be a diplomat? No. Do you understand diplomat? Yes. How do you say diplomat in Korean? Do you want to take the exam to be a diplomat? If you did, then maybe you can go to New York and negotiate about those regulations at the UN. Okay? Is that exciting? Negotiating about a, you passed your exam and now you're going to negotiate a new regulation about the postal service? Should we change the code to make international code or not? Leave like this. All right. So then, uh, let's move on to the next part, talk about the global regulation. So let's look at the tobacco. So about 5 million people die every year due to tobacco-related illness. So there appears to be a ground for declaring tobacco a global menace that should not be tolerated anywhere on earth. Do you smoke? No. No? Do you think tobacco is a global menace? <laughs> if you do? So, this, the global tobacco industry has prospered despite the regulatory measures enforced by the World Health Organization and many countries is a lesson to us how political power is exercised in the age of market globalism. It is where the goals of the multinationals are clearly in conflict with public health and welfare. So, we're using this example because it's very clear, right? Tobacco is being scientifically shown to be very bad for people's health. But on the other hand, it also makes profit for the multinational companies. Okay? So, <clears throat> the tobacco industry defends the global smoker, and they make some lawsuits. Do you understand lawsuits? No. Lawsuit means just taking people to court. Okay? Do you understand to take somebody to court? Yes. Then you take your lawsuit against them. 
So we file a lawsuit. Do you understand file? File the paper? Yes. So that's the verb we use. So Uruguay, Australia, Ireland, other countries pass the anti-smoking legislation like advertising on the box, you need to show the lungs. Have you seen that kind of advertising? Yes. Do you want me to show you? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to faint? <laughs> and I get into trouble? Hmm? Is, will anybody faint? I need to ask before I show a picture of lungs. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> So we can see that they have this kind of thing, right? Like this kid or this this kind of thing. Right? Some problem with the lungs. Well it's gonna be even worse. Yes. Worse than that. So here. Mm -hmm. Yes, this kind of thing, right? Tooth decay and lungs and so on. So we put that kind of thing on the box in Ireland or Australia, right? In Britain. So the Australian Packaging Law of 2012, British American Tobacco and Japan Tobacco International filed suit against the Australian government, claiming that the Tobacco Plain Packaging Act amounted to an acquisition of property. <laughs> so they said, this is our property, the box is our property. So you are uh, violating our fundamental right to property. That's our property, so you can, we can do with that like we want. Uh, Philip Morris sued the government of Uruguay. It was over-regulating tobacco. In this case, Uruguay is a small country with just 5 million people. Do you know Suarez? Yes. Soccer player? Uh, He's from uh, Uruguay, uh, right? The Uruguayan government doesn't have that much money. Who has more money to spend on lawyers? Uruguayan government or Philip Morris International, global tobacco company? Philip Morris International, right? So their lawyers claim that Uruguay put disturbing pictures and health warnings on a cigarette package. In this case, they used the excuse of that bilateral investment treaty. So Uruguay had an investment treaty with another country. They said, this is, not, this is violating the investment treaty. So even if the tobacco co companies don't win those cases, they cause the country to spend a lot of time and money on the court case and effort. Okay? And it makes the country think about making a new law. They think, oh, we're not going to make a law against the tobacco company, right? We're going to end up in court for the next four years. We could even lose. Okay? Yes? Hmm? Some of these disputes I have not finished yet. They take years, this kind of case. Yes. That's the problem. There's appeal, and that even though you win, there's another appeal, and so on, right? So, <clears throat> tobacco companies have made efforts to prevent the implementation of public health policy. So, for example, while this case is ongoing, the judge might say, while we're deciding this case, you can't do this advertising. Right? Wait until the decision is, is finished, right? And uh, they also make efforts to reduce the funding of tobacco control within the UN organization. So they make this kind of strategy. They discredit key individuals, lobby journalists, they make relationships with the staff on the WHO, consultants and advisor, place industry consultants in positions at the WHO, thereby compromising the integrity of policy making. They try to manipulate the scientific and public debate about the health effects of tobacco, and secret monitoring of the WHO meetings and conferences, right? Almost like a spy agency. You could make a movie, right? They're putting some spy into WHO, uh, spying on the meetings, that kind of thing. Did you know those kind of things were happening? No? Less obvious way, just making a relationship with the staff, lobbying the journalists that they don't make the stories. Originally, it took a long time for the health information to come out that the tobacco was very damaging. You had some scientific research which showed cigarettes are fine, cigarettes are good for your health. 
Right? By respected doctors and respected researchers in the, as late as the 70s or 80s. Of course, these studies were funded by the tobacco company. Okay? But that's, that's called confusing people. People are not sure. Maybe. Maybe it's bad, maybe it's not. Right? If you're a smoker, maybe you want to believe that it's not bad. So you, you uh, believe that. So I think the time is finished for today, so we will continue in the next class. Chris, yes. I heard that <coughs> our final exam is going to be from here to here. Is that true? <laughs> uh, just she asked me about the case study.